that it was still, as Alex put it, a fucking terrible waste. A year on, Colin and Alex suggested a reunion. On the anniversary of Adrian's death, the three of us met for drinks at the Charing Cross Hotel, then went for an Indian meal. We tried to invoke and celebrate our friend. We remembered him telling old Joe Hunt he was out of a job and instructing Phil Dixon about Eros and Thanatos. We were already turning our past into anecdote. We recalled cheering the announcement that Adrian had won a scholarship to Cambridge. We realised that though he had been to all our homes, none of us had been to his, and that we didn't know, had we ever asked, what his father did. We toasted him in wine at the hotel bar and in beer at the end of dinner. Outside we slapped one another around the shoulders and swore to repeat the commemoration annually. But our lives were already going in different directions, and the shared memory of Adrian was not enough to hold us together. Perhaps the lack of mystery about his death meant that his case was more easily closed. We would remember him all our lives, of course, but his death was exemplary rather than tragic, as the Cambridge newspaper had routinely insisted, and so he retreated from us rather quickly, slotted into time and history. By now I'd left home and started work as a trainee in arts administration. Then I met Margaret. We married and three years later Susie was born. We bought a small house with a large mortgage. I commuted up to London every day. My traineeship turned into a long career. Life went by. Some Englishman once said that marriage is a long dull meal with the pudding served first. I think that's far too cynical. I enjoyed my marriage, but was perhaps too quiet, too peaceable for my own good. After a dozen years, Margaret took up with a fellow who ran a restaurant. I didn't much like him, or his food for that matter, but then I wouldn't, would I? Custody of Susie was shared. Happily, she didn't seem too affected by the breakup, and, as I now realise, I never applied to her my theory of damage. After the divorce, I had a few affairs, but nothing serious. I would always tell Margaret about any new girlfriend. At the time, it seemed a natural thing to do. Now, I sometimes wonder if it was an attempt to make her jealous, or perhaps an act of self-protection, a way of preventing the new relationship from becoming too serious. Also, in my more emptied life, I came up with various ideas which I termed projects, perhaps to make them sound feasible. None of them came to anything. Well, that's no matter, or any part of my story. Susie grew up, and people started calling her Susan. When she was twenty-four, I walked her up the aisle of a register office. Ken is a doctor. They have two kids now, a boy and a girl. The photos of them I carry in my wallet always show them younger than they are. That's normal, I suppose, not to say philosophically self-evident. But you find yourself repeating, they grow up so quickly, don't they? When all you really mean is... Time goes faster for me nowadays. Margaret's second husband turned out to be not quite peaceable enough. He took off with someone who looked rather like her but was that crucial ten years younger. She and I remain on good terms. We meet at family events and sometimes have lunch. Once, after a glass or two, she became sentimental and suggested we might get back together. Odder things have happened, was the way she put it. No doubt they have, but by now I was used to my own routines and fond of my solitude. Or maybe I'm just not odd enough to do something like that. Once or twice we talked of sharing a holiday, but I think we each expected the other to plan it and book the tickets and hotels. So that never happened. I'm retired now. I have my flat with my possessions. I keep up with a few drinking pals and have some women friends, platonic of course and they're not part of the story either. I'm a member of the local history society, though less excited than some about what metal detectors unearth. A while ago I volunteered to run the library at the local hospital. I go round the wards delivering, collecting, recommending. It gets me out, and it's good to do something useful. Also I meet some new people. Sick people, of course. Dying people as well. 
But at least I shall know my way round the hospital when my turn comes. And that's life, isn't it? Some achievements and some disappointments. It's been interesting to me, though I wouldn't complain or be amazed if others found it less so. Maybe, in a way, Adrian knew what he was doing. Not that I would have missed my own life for anything, you understand.